uh, this particular webinar, we were quite keen to emphasize Asia. So we have four presentations, all of them focused on different countries in Asia. Um, and uh, coming from Australia, that's particularly heartwarming for me. I'm also a professor of economics at the University of New South Wales in Sydney, Australia, and that is where uh, CPA uh, is based. In Australia, we always pay tribute to the traditional custodians of our land. Uh, so let me do that. I'd like to show my respect and acknowledge the traditional custodians uh, on which this meeting takes place, and also to all of us past and present, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders who are present here today. I'm joining from Gadigal land, and if you wish, you can uh, acknowledge through the chat the uh, traditional custodians of the land on which you're currently joining. In fact, in a previous, a previous webinar, we had people from America list their traditional lands as well. It's my great pleasure to introduce uh, a very distinguished group. We have 200 registrations, more than 200 registrations, people from academia, government industry, and also the community. Uh, and I'd also like to welcome today's speakers. We have more than 45 countries represented in our registration list. Let me just say a word or two about IPRA, the International Pension Research Association. This was established in 2019 by three centers, CEPA, NETSPA in Holland, uh, Pension Research Council uh, at Wharton, and also importantly, um, the OECD, uh, the International Organization of Pension Supervisors, and Willis Tiles Watson. Um, it's an international organization, and the idea is to bring together um, people from around the world who are interested in pensions research. We do have a range of membership options for individuals, organizations, and those with research interests. And uh, Silky is going to type the website into the chat box if you wish to have access to that. Um, there's a range of people who are in the inaugural executive committee, but I'm not going to read them out. What I'd like to do is introduce Mike Orzak, who is one of those um, inaugural executive committee members, and he's going to chair tonight's session. Um, so he has, he's a mover and shaker. He's with Willis Towers Watson, head of global research at Willis Towers Watson, and he has had a very distinguished career. He's very interested in pensions and risk management and insurance, life insurance, labor economics, all those things. He's a founding editor of the Journal of Pension Economics and Finance. And in fact, it was really his push that got it to the point where it was established. He is a co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of Pensions and Retirement Income back in 2005. And his current interests lie in decision-making under uncertainty and labor issues connected with multinationals. Has a PhD from the University of Michigan and an AB from Princeton. So welcome, Mike. Thank you for your participation and thank you for um, running this session. And I wanna um, add to John's thanks to all the participants for joining and all the speakers. Um, this is gonna be a really interesting um, session because um, a lot of the um, elderly in the future will be in Asia and the problem of managing the, uh, their, their pensions and retirement is a critical one. Um, each speaker will speak for 20 minutes. The first speaker, um, is and, and all the biographies and the, uh, the, all, the, all the speakers today are extremely distinguished and have very long biographies, but so I don't cut into their time. Um, I'm just gonna state the name, the name of the speaker and the affiliation. Um, Sigiri Katao from University of Tokyo is gonna talk about why women work the way they do in, in Japan and the roles of fiscal policies. Um, Professor Katao. Thank you so much for the introduction, and I'm, um, I'm very honored to be part of this exciting conference. So today I'm gonna, we're going to start from the far east, Japan, and then we're going to uh, probably shift to the west. So I'm going to talk about Japan, and especially the uh, women in Japan. So this is a joint work. I'm a professor at the University of Tokyo, and this is a joint work with my uh, uh, co-worker at the University of Tokyo, Minamo Mikoshiba, who's on the market this year. Okay, so just to give you a motivation in the background of this paper, uh, we study uh, female uh, 
labor force participation in Japan. And as you may or may not know, Japan falls far behind other developed countries or even developing countries in terms of filling the gender gap. So according to the most recent uh, uh, global gender gap report of World Economic Forum, Japan ranks 116th among 146 countries. And uh, if you look at the scores, it consists of actually four different dimensions. And we do very well in terms of the educational attainment and the health. So we have a very uh, educated, healthy women. But in terms of their economic participation and political empowerment, the scores are really bad. And the economic participation in particular, uh, which is the focus of this uh, uh, talk today, uh, is very bad. And uh, But if you just look at the participation rates of women, it's not so bad. I mean, the average participation rate of women in Japan is 73%, which is lower than men. But compared to the OECD average, it's actually higher. But if you look at the, how much they are making, it's much, much lower than that of men. And we have an earlier paper where we looked at the, um, you know, the uh, labor force participation profile and the earnings of women over the life cycle. So on the left, we have a picture of the participation rates of women and men in Japan in 2015. So you can see there's a, uh, some gap. So there's a typical you know, M-shaped uh, participation profile. Some women leave the labor force um, you know, when they get married and they have kids and then they come back. So that's the pattern that we see in the data. But if you look at the average earnings, you can see that there's a huge gap on the right. So we, in this paper, in that paper, earlier paper, we studied, you know, what if what's going to happen to the Japanese fiscal, fiscal situation going forward if we somehow manage to be able to fill this gap. So what we found is that it's really important, uh, not just looking at the participation rates, but also, you know, how women work and then how, you know, think about uh, you know, the human capital accumulation process over the life cycle. But in that paper, we didn't really ask why women are choosing to participate this way and why women are not making you know, as much as men. So that's what we do in this project. So we want to understand, build a model to understand you know, what explains uh, this pattern. So the, basic, the two uh, big questions that we want to answer in this paper is this, uh, in the following. So first, we want to understand why uh, women choose to work the way they do. So in order to do that, uh, we're going to look at the panel data called the JPSC, Japan Panel uh, Survey of Consumers, which follows women uh, uh, since uh, the women uh, who were born in 1960s. So right now, these uh, women are about uh, 50, uh, 50, late 50s, so that we can follow, you know, what the uh, choices they made over the life cycle, when they did, when they get, did they get married, and what kind of jobs they had over the life cycle, so that we can build a model and then try to um, explain uh, their behavior. And then, uh, so that model is an economic model, and uh, it, uh, it's a model that distinguishes, of course, between men and women. And also uh, marital status is quite important in accounting for their uh, participation pattern. So we're going to distinguish between singles and the couples. And what's really important in Japan is to look at the distinction among different employment types. So there are jobs called the regular jobs and the contingent jobs. So those are the important margins that we take into account. And then once we build a model to explain, you know, the behavior of women, then we can, you know, think about that, what's the effect of different fiscal policies. So in doing so, I'm going to focus on three uh, fiscal policies that are embedded in the social security system and also the tax system in Japan. So there are many policies uh, that are meant to support low-income women. So back in 1960s and 70s, men always went outside and work and women stayed inside and then women live longer and they don't make much money. So the government really wanted to help women. And uh, we have a lot of policies to help you know, those uh, low-income, basically you know, housewives. So there's a spousal deductions. If women are working, not working, then the husband can get a lot of deductions from their income tax base. And then uh, for the social insurance system, they have to contribute, but you know, women do not have any, any earnings, then uh, they can get exemptions from the social insurance premium payment. And then uh, if husbands die before uh, you know, wives, then uh, the women can also get the survivor's pension benefits. Okay, so we want to understand what these policies which are meant to support you know, low-income women are doing. So the closest paper to ours is uh, this paper by Borelia, Denardi, and Young, which is uh, forthcoming at the, at the Review of Economic Studies. So 
they uh, wanted to understand the effect of the joint taxation in the US and then also the social security survivors benefit. They built a life cycle model, which incorporates the marriage dynamics and different household structures. And then they uh, focus on the cohort born in 1950s. So what they found is that without these two policies, participation rates of women would have been higher by 20 percentage points and uh, people would have saved more and the welfare could be higher. So we do something similar uh, in the context of the Japanese economy, but the model has to be changed a rather drastically because uh, this, uh, you know, Japan, as I mentioned, has a very uh, unique uh, feature of the labor market, which is uh, two tiered. So it has, uh, you know, when women decide to work, it's not just about uh, whether to participate or not or how many hours to work, but they have to choose uh, what kind of jobs they want to take. There's a job called the regular and then there's a job called the contingent job. So I'm going to talk more about that, which um, have very different fiscal treatment and uh, the earnings level and growth are very different. And then we also have the rich accumulate, uh, human capital accumulation process in the model. So um, let me jump onto the data that we use. Um, so we're going to use this uh, panel data, which follows the life of women uh, born in 1950s. And uh, our, um, yeah, so it has a very nice data. So it has an information about the employment types of each woman, each woman, and uh, how many years they have worked as a as a you know regular worker or contingent worker, and what's the education background and marital status. And it also has information about the husband's husband's uh, uh, jobs and earnings, and also a number of kids. So we can you know consider all these heterogeneity in the model, and uh, we're gonna use the uh, data of the cohort born in 1960s. So mainly we're gonna focus on the behavior of women aged between 25 and 50. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, the employment type is going to be critical. And how are we going to identify that uh, employment type? That's based on the answer to a uh, self-reported answer to a question. So there's a survey question that are you working as a regular worker or contingent worker? And then the division is based on that. So what exactly is uh, you know, the de definition? So if you're Japanese, I mean, regular worker, a contingent worker, we sort of know what it is, but it's very hard to explain because it's not, there's no like legal definition of the regular worker or contingent workers. So they may share some of the characteristics, but if you pick up a worker and then ask if she's a regular worker or contingent worker, there's a really clear distinction. So let me tell you the typical features of the regular workers so that you have an idea. So regular workers, not always, but most of them are work as a full-time worker, but sometimes uh, they work a regular no, part-time. So it's not really about the time, but many of them work as a full-time. And then they are typically hired directly by the employer, not from their dispatch agency. And the jobs are much more stable. They pay more. And uh, regular workers compared to contingent workers are expected to very flexibly engage in different tasks. So if the company says you go to New York next week, maybe not, not next week, but in two weeks, then you're going to have to pack up and then bring your family over there. So not all their jobs are going to be that uh, demanding but typically, you know, you're supposed to follow the rule of the company and the lifetime employment uh, belongs to this regular, regular worker. And the contingent workers are different and uh, they, they may share some characteristic of the regular workers, but not all of them. All of them. And typically, uh, they are hired on their fixed term contract and it also includes the part-time workers and temporary workers, also dispatched workers, and then they're more, more susceptible susceptible to layoffs. So during the COVID, um, unemployment rate didn't move that much in Japan, but uh, most of the, you know, the layoff happened to contingent workers, but regular workers already lost their jobs. So they, their jobs are much more stable. So if you look at the data and the participation rates uh, over the life cycle of uh, women of this cohort. So this is the uh, total uh, participation rate. So as you can see, the participation rate starts at 70% at age 25, and it goes down dramatically, and then it increases. And if you look at the decomposition of composition of this uh, participation and break it down to regular workers and the contingent workers, you can see clearly different pattern. So the share of the regular worker uh, drops dramatically over, uh, you know, between 25 and 35, and then it never picks up. And the contingent worker, the share go, keeps going up right, from 10% to 50%. 
And if you look at this uh, a breakdown by marital status on the single on the left, so you can see the share of the regular worker doesn't really go down among singles, but for the married women, uh, the share of the regular worker stays really low and the share of contingent uh, keeps increasing and not, level, not in level force declines. So what happens when people, women, women get married is that you're gonna jump from this uh, uh, left picture from single to married. And then when, when you do so, you're gonna switch from regular to either not in level force or contingent. And then uh, if you want to go back to work um, after your kids leave your house, then uh, you're going to start working, resume working as a contingent worker. And as a consequence, what do you get? So this is the earnings profile of a regular worker and a contingent worker. I also distinguish between their skill type. So high is above college and uh, college or higher and the low is below college. So there's some skill premium, but the big you know, difference uh, inequality in earnings is not between the skill type in Japan, but it's be between the, you know, this uh, uh, employment type. So you can see that the regular high worker earns more, and but the, the next one is the regular worker of a low skill type, right? So even if you are college educated, uh, as long as you have a contingent job, your earnings are going to be very low. And what's also uh, remarkable is that the earnings profile is extremely flat uh, if you work as a contingent worker. So even if you accumulate your experience 10 years, 20 years, your earnings are not going to go up. So, so that's the data. And uh, in terms of the policies, um, so sorry, it's, it's a little uh, details about the social insurance system, but I have to tell you what they are. So we have a very comprehensive uh, social insurance system. We have the universal coverage of pension, medical, long-term care. They are very generous, so you have to pay a lot. But you know who's going to pay how much depends on the job that you have and also marital status. So I pay like 15% out of my earnings and my employer, University of Tokyo pays 15% of my earnings. So it's 30% in total. So that's a quite a lot. And, uh, but uh, uh, if uh, you know, I'm married to someone who is covered at work, then I don't have to pay any. Uh, as long as my earnings do not exceed this threshold of 1.3 million yen. So you're going to be fully exempted from this 30% or 15% at, at the worker level taxes uh, if you're married and if your income is low. But the moment your earnings go above this 1.3 million yen, all of a sudden you're going to have to pay 30%. So there's a big uh, 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 you know, jump in the marginal tax there. And all the others, including the people in not in level force, uh, they have to pay uh, they on their own. And for the pension benefits, so the Japanese pension system consists of uh, uh, two parts, lump sum part and then also part, the part that is related to earnings. And uh, if your husband dies before you do, then you can get uh, you can claim the survivor's benefit, which is also very generous. 75% of this uh, second part of the benefit. Okay. And uh, for the labor income taxes, uh, labor income tax, uh, there's a spousal deductions. So if your husband, uh, if your if your wife is not working and uh, you know her her income is not that high, then the husband can claim this deduction of seven sixty thousand yen, which is not a small amount. It, it was reduced down to three eighty thousand in two thousand four, but that's standing as the big tax of uh, you know the participation for women. And the tax system in Japan is not the uh, joint tax as in the US, but you know this labor income tax is basically making this uh, as a joint tax. And uh, I'm not going to go into, into all the details of the model, but uh, the model is uh, you know the life cycle model that consists of women, the men and the women, and singles and the married couples. And the people in the model are different in terms of the age, gender, marital status, and we also keep track of the uh, presence of the small child because that seems to be a very important factor in accounting for their uh, change in the participation of uh, uh, women. And uh, also they are different in terms of the skill, education, and how many years they worked as a regular worker contingent workers and uh, previous employment, what you were doing last year, because there's some switch costs of you know, changing the employment status. And then we also keep track of the assets and the average past earnings, which account for the social security benefits. And then we let them choose the following uh, endogenous variables. So they, they choose consumption saving and women are going to decide in the model uh, whether they want to work as a regular worker or contingent worker or stay out of labor force. Okay. And uh, there will be human capital um, accumulation in the model. So it depends on, you know, I show you the I showed you the picture of the uh, wages. So we try to replicate that uh, by, you know, uh, coming up with this uh, human capital accumulation function, which depends on the job type and also the skills and other things. Okay. So what's important is uh, whether women 
you know, how they want to work, I mean, uh, whether they want to participate, if they want to participate, uh, what they want to do. So labor supply, whether they want to work or not, you also, you know, you're going to compare good thing and bad thing and then make a decision. So what's good about working? So you make earnings. What's bad? Uh, there's a participation cost. You're going to lose your leisure. Okay, somebody unmuted. Okay, so and the negative thing is the participation cost, and you lose your leisure time. And then you know because we have a, a progressive tax, so if you make more, then the marginal tax rate is going to be higher. But we're gonna make the model really complicated, um, not because I can handle that, but because uh, these are necessary features to understand you know what's going on uh, in the female labor force participation and the roles of these policies that I mentioned. So it's a dynamic model, uh, and also the human capital is endogenous. So, you know, positive, good thing about working more is not just today's earnings, but you also take into account, um, you know, your human capital. So you, you keep on working, and if you don't work, then your human capital is going to depreciate. You also take that into account. And uh, there's a, a life cycle, so work and retirement phase, so that we can, you know, think about the effect of working, so that that will contribute to the uh, more pension that you're going to receive after you retire. And uh, we also have the family structure so that we can think about this, uh, you know, the uh, family related uh, policies and there's a cost of the child care and uh, uh, there's a, um, uh, a benefit system that uh, depend on the family status. Okay. And uh, there will be uh, employment type distinctions and earnings are going to depend on the human capital, uh, which is accumulated over the life cycle. And there's some preference uh, that depends on consumption and the leisure. And uh, you know, women and the men, uh, if they are married, they try to maximize you know their happiness by choosing the consumption labor supply. So that's a typical thing that the, these models do. And uh, leisure of a woman in the model uh, depends on the total time that she has. And then there's some cost of participating. There's uh, some lost uh, you know, uh, uh, hours by participating. And then also there's some cost of switching the jobs, going from not in labor force to a regular job or you know, contingent job, it's very hard. So that's also uh, considered in terms of their leisure time. And then there's additional cost of taking care of kids if you have a small one. So we're going to calibrate these parameters so that we're going to be able to match the uh, participation profile that we saw earlier. We saw earlier. Okay. And then for the government policies, we're going to you know keep track of their actual government policies uh, since 1960s. And uh, households, you know, they, they, we, we let them start work their life at age 25, and then they go uh, retirement phase. And uh, since I'm running out of time, let me jump onto the result. So this is the, what the, the model uh, generates. So the dots are the data that we saw earlier, and uh, these are, uh, you know, the lines are the model. So we do pretty well in, in matching the uh, data. And uh, this is the uh, participation profile, regular worker, contingent worker for singles and married. So we do quite very well. So we're going to use this to understand, you know, what's going to happen to uh, if the economy if there's a change in the policy. So the three policies that we were interested in, the spousal deduction and uh, you know, exemption from this 15% uh, social insurance premium and the survivor's pension benefits. So if we get rid of this spousal deductions, so if husbands can get the, you know, the big deduction from the income tax base, if your wife doesn't work, if we remove that, that will basically remove the entry cost. So what's going to happen is that there will be an increase in the participation cost, as you can see, and the increase in the participation rate. And But that comes mostly from the contingent workers. There's a big increase in the contingent worker, but there's almost no change in the regular worker. Okay, They want to work because the entry cost is gone, but you know you still have to want, to, want not to work too much because there's another uh, barrier, which is this uh, social insurance premium. Right, The moment you hit this uh, wall, then you're going have to start to pay a lot of taxes. So what's going to happen if we remove this uh, social insurance premium exemption, then what's going to happen is that uh, similarly, we're going to have a big increase in the participation, but that comes from the rise in the regular workers rather than the contingent worker. Some contingent workers will shift to the regular jobs and then you know the composition is going to change. And something similar if we remove the survivor's benefits. And what happens to the earnings, that's the picture on the right. So there will be a big increase in their particip uh, participation and also earnings, but you can also see that their earnings growth rate is also going to be very different. So women are going to start to have more regular uh, jobs and then their accumulation uh, human capital is going to be much higher over the life cycle. 
So just to uh, summarize, so there's an increase in the participation of about 13%, and that comes from the big increase in the regular job. And uh, earnings are also going to go up by 30%, and uh, that comes from the rise in the earnings of married women. Of course, they have to pay a lot more. So there will be a, a payment, a big increase in the payment. So the uh, total social insurance and tax payment of women will go up by 20%. So that's not good. But you know, uh, there's more earnings. So what's going to happen to the consumption? It depends on the you know the uh, numbers. And it turns out that the consumption is also going to be higher. And the government is also collecting more taxes. So uh, if you want to understand the welfare effects, you also have to take into account what the government is going to do with the additional money. So if you assume that the government is going to just uh, you know pay back the lump, lump sum transfer, then uh, the welfare gain can be expected as well. <laughs> so just to wrap up, so we show that uh, you know there are many policies that are meant to support low-income dependent uh, wives, but these are actually doing very. Uh, different uh, jobs in, in creating some distortions on the women's participation, choice of employment types and the earnings growth. And uh, if we remove all these policies, then we can also expect to have much higher uh, tax revenues. And then we also be able to fill the, fill the uh, help fill the you know, gender gap. So we're not doing uh, this exercise going into the future. But if you think about the demographic aging and the fiscal challenges that Japan is going to face, we're going to have to you know, maximize um, the use of uh, available resources, especially the labor. So it's quite important. It's going to be more important to think about uh, you know, removing all these uh, obstacles. That's it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Let's move on to the next um, speaker. Um, uh, Dr. George Cordna uh, of uh, UNSW Sydney, um, who um, is going to talk about macro demographics and aging in emerging Asia, the case of Indonesia, um, much different um, situation than Japan. George. Thank you, Mike, and uh, thank you to organizers uh, for, for inviting us. It's a great pleasure to present in, uh, for, for this audience. Uh, and uh, so in this um, paper, uh, we uh, focus on emerging Asia and in particular, uh, East and uh, Southeast Asia in terms of uh, macro demographics and in terms of uh, household survey data on uh, Indonesia. And uh, it's a joint work with uh, Tranle, uh, who is a PhD student at uh, UNSW uh, School of Economics and uh, John Pigott, uh, Director of CEPAR and Scientia Professor of Economics at University of New South Wales. And I'm a, a Senior Research Fellow at CEPAR. So in terms of um, outline here, I first uh, talk a little bit about the background uh, to this project, uh, referring to sort of the broader uh, linkage projects uh, that we have, where kind of the main objective is, is to model um, uh, pension policies uh, in emerging Asia. Uh, this paper is really about uh, the data uh, to kind of fit the models, um, so uh, that's going to be the focus. Uh, I provide some demographic context, which is uh, important uh, because many people know about Japan that uh, it's aging rapidly and it's very old already. Uh, many of these kind of uh, Southeast Asian countries uh, will actually be aging even more rapidly uh, than Japan and some countries even will be older uh, by uh, the end of this century. Uh, then kind of I will focus on uh, the uh, insight uh, that um, the, the household survey data, uh, IFLS, Indonesian, uh, family life survey data uh, can give here. And uh, finally, I provide some uh, summary. And if I have time, I talk about this on ongoing uh, modeling project uh, uh, that, um, that, that um, we're working on. So in terms of uh, the background, uh, this, this data work is, is really a part of a uh, broad uh, linkage project on uh, policy modeling for aging in emerging Asia, Indonesia, and beyond. And there, kind of the objective is to provide and model um, retirement income support in emerging Asia uh, with objective to increase welfare, reduce poverty and inequality among older people. And uh, why is it important? Uh, the imperatives uh, here are uh, rapid aging uh, due to particularly uh, lower fertility in the past, uh, higher informal labor force uh, and uh, very immature social protection structures. So um, th this paper will really uh, deal uh, about the first two. Um, and we have um, a recent other paper uh, that kind of documents uh, uh, social pol the pension policy um, in, in emerging Asia, uh, which I reference here too. 
Um, so in terms of the data use uh, in the project, uh, in terms of the demographics, macro demographics, uh, we draw on um, uh, United Nations uh, world population prospects uh, data. Um, in terms of the um, household survey data, the main focus is uh, on Indonesia uh, family life survey. Um, and uh, we also kind of look at uh, uh, national labor force survey and national social economic surveys uh, in Indonesia. Um, IFLS, um, it's uh, ongoing uh, longitudinal um, survey uh, with uh, following five waves. Uh, the main focus of, of this report is uh, on the last three waves. Uh, it's uh, representative of 83% uh, of population. It has uh, 330,000 uh, plus uh, individuals uh, in 13 provinces, and it's rich in uh, social economic uh, variables. Um, and, and also uh, we can derive uh, coverage of public pension uh, programs. So uh, before kind of I get into the IFLS, uh, let's kind of look at um, uh, demographic. Uh, it's, let's provide some demographic context here for uh, these East and uh, Southeast Asian uh, economies. And uh, so the first two graphs here shows uh, the demographic inputs drivers of uh, aging. Um, and that's due mainly to kind of uh, significant drops in uh, total fertility rate. So that's uh, quite different uh, to, to Japan, for example, where uh, the, the fertility patterns are kind of uh, similar to other developed countries. Here, the, the drop is really uh, significant. And that's kind of driving here, or will be driving the population aging um, um, in, in this uh, century, which is uh, quite rapid, as you can see here. So the countries like Indonesia, they still have a, a young population. Um, uh, but when you look at the age dependency ratio, uh, around 10%, uh, but that's about uh, to increase by fivefold uh, by the end of this uh, century. Um, so um, in terms of the IFLS data, um, the objective here is really to fit uh, uh, OLG models. And by OLG models, uh, you know, I want to emphasize the OLG structure where kind of uh, people face uh, finite lives, uh, they, they, they sort of uh, make a decision over the life cycle. And in our uh, case, uh, we want to integrate uh, formal and informal employment. Uh, and Indonesia is here an important study, um, case study, because uh, there's basically uh, almost uh, no social pension. Uh, so many people at older age are not covered at all. Uh, and it has uh, great data. Um, you know, I already mentioned the uh, national uh, labor and uh, social economic surveys. Here kind of we, uh, focus uh, on uh, Indonesian family life survey, uh, which uh, has much in common uh, with the HRS uh, family surveys. It's longitudinal, uh, but also uh, it's covering the whole life, economic life cycle and in plus for household head. It's almost uh, nationally representative uh, and it has uh, multiple domains, uh, finance, education, work, health, family circumstances. Uh, and it's publicly available and uh, you know it's uh, in English. So um, this paper really focuses on the labor force uh, and uh, on older people and particularly on uh, flow uh, variables here. Um, and uh, for the labor force in particular, um, what's important is um, definition of kind of informal employment. Um, and here we kind of draw on other studies, uh, but there's dif differences in kind of uh, definition of informal sector or unemployment. What we use uh, is uh, we kind of uh, include all uh, self-employed uh, as informal, but uh, also here uh, employees with no health insurance uh, and other medical expenditures uh, from employers. So I should say that uh, we can also kind of look at um, those who are paid uh, social contributions and their kind of uh, the informality would be even larger. And uh, the, the main focus, as I said, is uh, on the last three weights, uh, which, which, which are uh, compatible. So just first looking at the labor force composition. Uh, so this table uh, shows shares of formal and informal uh, employment uh, in different ways. Uh, and uh, overall, uh, which show where we pull uh, always uh, together. Uh, and there sort of, you can see that uh, informal employment is high, uh, here 77.4%. I should also say here, we focus on males uh, only. Um, I, sh I show you kind of how things will change uh, if, if we incorporate females. Um, 
if you look at the, the differences between the waves, there were some changes, uh, but not that much. Uh, so the, the uh, informal employment did not change uh, that much. So uh, sort of we can, here we can show, see that informal employment is high, but also uh, persistent. Um, just kind of drawing on uh, Kagiri's um, presentations, focusing on females. Um, we also look at the females, but they change the sample. Uh, or the informality. And here, kind of, you can see in the second column, then looking just females, um, the informality share goes up, but just a little bit. Uh, and I think uh, that here, uh, Indonesia is perhaps uh, an outlier. Uh, other uh, Southeast Asian countries um, may have much higher informality uh, amongst females, uh, which was shown, for example, by um, Lisa Cameron from uh, Melbourne uh, University. Now, uh, in, the, um, in, in the paper, we kind of also distinguish uh, between um, uh, different skills uh, by kind of uh, looking at educational level. Uh, and there actually you can see that uh, over time, uh, the skills, uh, the, the composition of skills were changing. So there's more uh, higher skill uh, people, uh, but they tend to stay uh, in the informal sector. Uh, that's kind of the main finding from these uh, compositions. Now we can kind of also look at uh, annual labor supply uh, and uh, total earnings here by total earnings. I mean, earnings in uh, all jobs. And um, I was quite surprised that uh, informal workers actually work fewer hours uh, than formal workers. That's sort of what you can see in this first diagram. Uh, I also say here irregular hours uh, in the paper uh, we also kind of show that uh, if you put in uh, restrictions on the minimum weeks work, so for example, if you exclude people who work less than uh, 15 weeks uh, per year, so then this gap uh, almost disappears. So this suggests to me that sort of informal workers not only work fewer hours, but also irregular hours. Uh, and then sort of, um, as you expect uh, here, um, the, the uh, gap between earnings uh, is quite large. And in fact, if you look at the gap between uh, low skill informal and high skill uh, formal, uh, the gap is almost 10 times uh, the, the highest kind of gap between uh, these earnings. So, so this tells you something about uh, inequality as well uh, in, in earnings uh, between formal and informal. Now we also look at the uh, employment or sector transition. I should say the sector and employment is here interchangeable. Okay, so so the first sort of uh, matrix here uh, shows you know we observe uh, those working in informal sector or uh, informal workers in 2007. Uh, this is kind of their age in 2007, and then we look at them in 2014. And what you can see here is uh, that. The informal to formal transition is low, 7%, and it declines uh, with age. Now, if you look at the uh, formal um, in 2007, uh, then the transition, it seems to be quite high here, 27%. But I should emphasize here that this transition uh, is uh, unlikely to be by, uh, because of their choice. Uh, so we also kind of show earnings of people who move and who stays, and they're people who move to the informal sector on average their earnings uh, almost halved. Now also you can see here that this transition goes up quite significantly uh, at older ages. And here that's uh, largely due to kind of low uh, retirement uh, age. So people kind of are forced out uh, from uh, the, the formal sector. Now that was uh, work that kind of we done uh, on um, uh, population age uh, 20 to 54. And now we kind of look at uh, older people here. And um, so we define older people uh, here by uh, 50 plus. Uh, so it's kind of a bit different definitions uh, to what I would use uh, for country like Australia. Uh, so it's just looking at the people here uh, and the number of co-residing children and percent of marriage. So I think that's, that the marriage is very high, particularly for males. Um, female um, marriage rate declines quite rapidly. So it suggests to me that there's also some uh, significant uh, uh, mortality gradient um, uh, by, by gender. Um, in terms of co-residing children, um, you see uh, th these numbers are quite high uh, compared to developed countries, uh, but uh, they, they've been declining, uh, partly kind of uh, due to uh, changes in the population structure.
Now we also look at uh, employment uh, and labor supply of older people. Um, and, and there you see much bigger differences between males and females. Uh, so uh, much higher sort of employment rate by uh, males compared to females. And also hours of work so, um, are significantly higher for males. And there's been kind of some changes uh, when we look at the wave uh, in 2000 and uh, 2014. Uh, we, we also look at the total income and the income sources. So before I go to the income sources, uh, when you look at the total income of older people, so you look, you look at uh, 50 plus the total income in percent of, of average earnings is quite low. It's about 25%. Uh, so much lower than uh, in developed countries. And that, that total income is declining. So for people 70 plus, uh, is less than 15%. Now, if you look at here, uh, the income composition, that's also very different. So the labor income is most important for people 50 uh, and over, and also quite significant uh, for, for people at uh, very old ages. Now, uh, for people 70 plus, uh, it's the transfers uh, from children that are important. The other very important difference uh, compared to developed countries is uh, very low asset income and non-labor income, which includes pensions here. Uh, so that's, uh, that's different. So um, I, I give a, a summary uh, here, and then I talk a little bit about uh, kind of the projects where we're taking this data uh, to. Um, so really uh, this, um, um, uh, projects uh, applies to countries uh, with rapid population aging, which I would say for many, it's it's not a common knowledge. I mean, uh, people know about Japan. People may not know for about countries like uh, Thailand that uh, uh, by uh, the end of century, uh, this century, uh, it will be almost as old as, um, as Japan. Uh, this large informal sector in our framework, it's kind of defined uh, to some extent uh, by uh, by this underdeveloped uh, social security system, uh, which is uh, uh, which is of most uh, policy concern. So we show here that uh, data can help in guiding policy. So uh, there's this kind of uh, forced transitions from the uh, formal sector because of uh, low retirement age. I mean, that's kind of been addressed in a country like Indonesia, that age is increasing, and that's happening in countries uh, like uh, China as well. Uh, I think it's kind of important to understand uh, this uh, employment uh, and income uh, patterns and income sources. That's an important start. Uh, and really, uh, kind of what we want to do is uh, similar things to, uh, to Sagiri uh, for Japan, uh, the modeling exercise, really, uh, where we want to kind of fit the models uh, to the data that I've shown uh, to generate impacts, um, to generate insight into policy impacts. Um, and the main focus so far uh, was on kind of pension reforms uh, in order to increase welfare, um, particularly and uh, and reduce inequality, particularly at the, at older age. And there, kind of, you may think of uh, policies related to social pensions. I already mentioned uh, the, the the retirement age or pension access age, but we can also look at uh, changes to environment, increasing formalization or um, uh, increasing investment in human capital. Uh, the, the, the last part here really uh, kind of relates to general equilibrium effect here, connecting uh, the, the policy uh, and the economy. But I think it, it's, it's very important that, that first uh, we kind of focus on, on matching uh, the household behavior uh, that kind of we observe uh, from these data sources. Uh, and this is kind of uh, what we're currently working on. Uh, so as I said, so this paper really look at uh, labor force uh, and labor supply uh, and, and, and older people. Um, uh, we managed now to sort of uh, connect uh, the labor force survey with the asset questionnaire. So can kind of look at asset holding uh, over the life cycle and different kind of Port asset compositions over the life cycle by formal, informal, high skill, low skill, including housing. Surprisingly little, very little has been done uh, on, on, on Southeast Asia. Um, and one of the findings there is uh, that home ownership uh, in, in country like Indonesia is very high, um, uh, but uh, savings, uh, financial asset uh, is very low and uh, pretty much non-existent uh, in, in um, 
formal, informal sector. We can also look at kind of a micro uh, demographics. It's what I call here micro demographics. And uh, one of the project is to kind of look at uh, fertility decisions and human capital choices that is done by uh, our uh, PhD students. So we kind of can look at, for example, fertility differentials uh, by formal and formal sector. So try to explain what what's cause, what caused this uh, significant drop in the uh, total fertility rate. And also I kind of am in, uh, interested in uh, self-employment. So we're doing some work on self-employment and that's basically uh, to to kind of apply different type of models uh, to, um, to to model the behavior. So, uh, so I show you, for example, that uh, almost 80% uh, of workers are in, that's almost 80% of labor force is informal. Um, about 50% are those classified as self-employed. And you kind of may think that uh, they make different decisions uh, than workers. They may invest into their business, uh, et cetera. So in terms of the modeling work, so, so mainly we focus on uh, pension reforms, um, uh, taking into account informality in emerging Asia. And uh, so kind of uh, here uh, we have a paper for Indonesia, but also the grant contributed uh, to, to, uh, to work of our uh, colleague Pitawat uh, that was done for Thailand. They're kind of the, uh, the impact, the, the, the main objective is to kind of look at introduction of social pensions. Um, and we kind of also have a PhD project uh, um, Huyen uh, Huang is working on um, pension reform and informality in Vietnam. Um, a, a different type of model is to kind of endogenize fertility. There was questions uh, by, by Mike. Uh, um, so endogenize uh, fertility, human capital, and look at kind of the role of uh, transfer uh, in country like Indonesia using IFLS data and um, we also started doing some work um, on um, on China uh, here. So one thing that sort of uh, I, I, we did not address here is the rural urban uh, migration that's uh, very large uh, in in many of these uh, uh, East and Southeast Asian countries, particularly in uh, in China. So that's uh, one of the projects that uh, we currently will be working on with uh, new uh, uh, research fellow uh, at CPAR Uehua. So I think I stop here. Thank you very much, George. The next talk is um, about um, um, results from one incredible data set, Charles, the Chinese Health and Retirement Survey. Um, the title of the paper is One Country, Two Systems, Evidence on Retirement Patterns in China, presented by um, Professor um, Yao Hui Chao um, of Beijing University. Thank you, Mike, for introducing me. And thank uh, John Pickard for inviting me to this uh, conference. Um, I was given this topic to discuss <laughs> this. Uh, John asked me to present this paper. Uh, this is joint work with a few other authors. Um, and it, it already appeared uh, in the Journal of Pension Economic and Finance, uh, 2021, that is the Mike's <laughs> journal. So, the, so as the title suggests, uh, we're looking at retirement patterns and we're uh, looking into uh, the rural urban uh, difference in China. Uh, so as, as you all know, China is facing the challenge of uh, aging. Uh, and uh, then, uh, then aging, the burden can be alleviated uh, by postponing retirement age. So, but we need to understand um, what determines or what, what influences people's decision uh, of retirement. So conceptually, um, the retirement decisions depend on labor supply side considerations, including their health preferences and their wealth, and labor demand side considerations, mainly the firm behavior, and also institutions. So we, we want to uh, focus on institutions in this paper, because um, the role is very um, evident when comparing the retirement patterns of urban and rural people. And we used uh, this nationally representative data, Charles, and we, and we take a closer look at uh, different features of institutions uh, and their associations with retirement behavior, especially uh, the urban, urban workers' retirement policy and then the, the pension um, provided to urban people. So the data is Charles, I think many of you already know. Uh, it's an HRS type survey and it started, I 
is biannual, and uh, since 2015, we changed to triannual. And we used the 2018 wave. Um, the, 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 this, this wave is already publicly available for download. And it's a nationally representative uh, sample of people over age 45 at the time of survey in 2011. Uh, it, it followed a random uh, sampling procedures, uh, multi-stage, and um, uh, uh, with some stratifications. So the baseline survey was in 2011. Uh, it, it covered um, close to 20,000 people in, 2000, in 150 counties to 28 provinces. This was a random uh, sample of counties. Um, it just happened to fall in 28 provinces. The data is, is already widely used. Our user number of users has, is approaching 70,000. And number of papers, number of English journal article papers uh, is, I think, around 1,500 by now. So it's a very known, well-known paper, well-known data set. So let me uh, first um, define retirement. We, we define retirement as um, if someone once worked but is not currently working, currently active in any of the economic activities, including farming, employed, self-employed, and unpaid family business, or unemployed, uh, and other employment. So, uh, so, so this is a very broad definition of working. Um, uh, and mandatory retirement age for urban workers, as you probably know, is very, very, very low. For, for men, it's age 60. For, a man, for women, uh, it's 50 for blue collar and 55 for white collar women. So the, so the uh, statutory retirement age is quite young. Um, so this figure shows uh, works. Uh, this figure shows um, um, retirement uh, of urban and rural people by sex. So the, the top line is, um, is urban female. As, as you can see, they retire um, the, the earliest of, of all the four groups. And the lowest line is, um, as, as you can guess, is rural men. Um, so, and the top two lines are urban, the um, bottom two lines are rural. So you can see this rural urban gap immediately. Uh, uh, at the age, for example, age 65 to 69 or 70, 70 to 74, um, more than half of um, rural people uh, are already, are still working, but 80 to uh, 70, uh, 80 to 90 percent of urban people are already retired. So there's very large, uh, sharp difference between urban and rural people. And we compare our uh, retirement rate with um, other OECD countries. Uh, the, and these countries' data are from uh, HRS type surveys uh, in Korea, Japan, and uh, SHARE, and also IFLS. So these, um, these data show that the first three row, the first three sets of uh, column uh, are um, China. And uh, the, the third one is urban and the second, the middle one is rural. You can see the rural urban difference. But if you compare with other countries, for example, if you look at the bottom panel, women, and if you look at the, the, the orange bar, uh, you, you can see that, that that rural women barely retire, but urban women uh, age 55 to 59, that's, uh, that's this age, that orange uh, bar, they are, the retirement rate is more than women in France, Germany, uh, um, uh, Japan, uh, and similar to the US. So our urban women, their pattern is quite similar to most some of the most advanced welfare states um, in, in, the, in the world. Uh, we also notice in the previous graph, there are these continuities of retirement. Uh, so this figure shows uh, uh, hazard risk, retirement hazard risk defined as among those who didn't retire 
before that age, how many would retire at, at, at that age. So the, the, the top, um, the dashed brown lines are urban women. As you can see their spike, there is a big spike at age 50. So there's a big discontinuous, a sharp uh, uh, rise at, at age 50, which is official uh, retirement age for blue collar women. And there's a smaller spike, but still a significant one at age 55. And this um, solid blue line is the urban men. And, the, and at, at age 60, not surprisingly, at the, our statutory retirement age, there's a big spike at age 50, uh, 60 and another one at age 55 which is um, the early retirement age. But the bottom, there are two lines, uh, somewhat invisible. The bottom two lines, they're quite smooth. These two lines are rural people. You barely see any spike. So, so, the, so they are the most natural retirement behavior determined by their demand and supply, et cetera, not affected by institutions. So, uh, so, so then we look at, um, why there are the differences? Um, we already heard uh, the retirement age, but then let's look at the pension, the social security pension. Um, uh, so, so, so we have many types of pension. Uh, there are employee pension, uh, which is firm pension or government or institution pension. And then our resident pension, uh, the dominant one being new rural social pension. You can see urban, among urban people, they're mostly eligible and mostly receiving uh, firm pension, firm or government pension. But the rural people, they predominantly um, are eligible for the rural uh, resident pension. And then, but if we look at the, the amount of money uh, that's given in these two type pension, you, you see a, a, a huge difference. The median pension income uh, among urban people is 20,100, but for rural people is only 90. This is monthly. Um, and, and it comes from the, the differences in, in the pension by these types. As you can see that the, the last, uh, that last column Firm pension, the average uh, monthly income is 26 or, or 4,000 for government, but for the rural, new rural pension is 50. So this explains the, the difference, the huge difference uh, in gender, in, in pension gap between uh, uh, urban and rural people. We also ask people uh, to tell us um, uh, when you are old and, and, not, and sick, not, not able to work, what would be, who will support you? What would be the source of income? And we see that for urban people, they, they 83% say they, they can rely on pension income. But for rural people, 68% said they rely on their children. Uh, we also look at children, are they, are they so reliable? And the, rural, the children of rural people, they have less education and they have less wealth. So, so they're basically had to rely on, 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 their, on themselves. So that's, so then we, we look, we do a regression analysis to look at the associations of pension, health status, et cetera, uh, with their employment status. And uh, this, this shows our regression results. It's this very basic uh, association type regression. It's nothing causal, but we can see that the pension, which is the red, um, uh, the, the red numbers, receiving employee pension is associated with a very large drop in employment. So this is a linear probability, uh, probability model, one being working and zero being not working. So 19% uh, reduction uh, for men and 20 percent percentage points reduction for women. And it, it, they represent like 23 percent or 78 percent. So the availability of receiving employee pension caused people or associated at least with a large decline in, in employment. And then the rural pension receiving the resident pension barely changes, uh, changes anything is, is, is even positive. So it's not, not significant. So this, this is strong evidence that, that retirement behavior is related to um, pension system. 
Uh, we also look at, look at some other things like health status. Uh, health is uh, number of ADL or IEDL difficulties significantly related to um, working, uh, uh, reduces possibility of working for both uh, urban and rural people. And also a spouse uh, health problem is associated with um, more working in rural. Um, so th there's an added work effect in rural areas. And we also look at the family care provision, the number of uh, young children present in the, in the household. It reduces uh, rural women's employment. So, so con to conclusion of this paper is that uh, retirement patterns vary a lot between urban and rural. Uh, it confirms the, the traditional um, idea that rural people work until they drop. And uh, the retirement patterns are possibly explained by mandatory pol retirement policy and the greater coverage and generous pension in urban areas. So, uh, so, so I, I have like six minutes. I, I'd like to tell you about one more paper, which is which came uh, out in the in China Economic Review, also 2021. Uh, the, the title is called Health Capacity to Work at Older Ages. It's also uh, co-authored with some of my colleagues at the, at the Charles Project. And the question we ask is, um, if health is the sole det uh, determined or consideration in retirement, how many more people could be working? Um, since we have uh, previous days, we have seen that urban people retire so early and rural people barely retire. So then the natural question is, are there excess capacity that could be tapped? Uh, if, since China is facing this aging uh, issue, uh, are there a potential uh, in making people work, uh, work longer? Uh, so, so there, um, in many OECD countries, people have already done this work. Uh, the, uh, the group led by David Weiss at NBER has uh, looked at uh, access work capacity determined by health in OECD countries in the HRS type of surveys. And we add to the literature, literature looking at Chinese urban people. So the, the method is uh, we use the pooled uh, three waves of data, uh, 2011, 13, 15. And we construct, we follow the, the literature and constructed a health index. It's called PVW index. Uh, it's put there by Vinti and Weiss. Uh, they, they, in their paper, they, they, um, they it's basically a uh, factor analysis, uh, including many health variables. So it is, it's intended to be a single health index that can, can be uh, linked to retirement or working decisions. Um, so uh, in the, the previous literature, they used um, uh, younger people, for example, before five years before the statutory retirement age and, uh, and to model the, the relationship between health and, re and employment and used the coefficients to project um, to predict uh, the 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 uh, the work status for older cohorts, and then compare with the actual to the actual retirement or work to to get the the gap uh, which is uh, excess excess work capacity. We we have a better um, group to compare to. We we use the rural people because we think the younger group uh, is is not an ideal benchmark for older people because the, the house situations uh, differ quite a lot. Uh, we use the rural people and we took to estimate the, the health and uh, employment relation. And uh, in doing so, we also exclude the, the, those rural people who work but, but have re really bad health. 10% uh, of the PVW index. So to, to, to be more fair to, um, to uh, urban people. Uh, and then we, we've applied the, the coefficient to simulate the, the employment outcome for urban people. Uh, and we use the same five-year age group. Uh, uh, for example, 60 to 65 year old rural as this benchmark, for the same age group for urban. So this, this improves um, 
over the previous literature and is uh, supposedly better estimation. Uh, and then we then the difference between the simulated um, uh, work um, ratio of work and actual uh, employment rate is the excess capacity. So let me show you the numbers. Uh, these uh, are the top ones are uh, 60 to 64 men and the bottom are women. And the first uh, column is China and then the rest are from the Wise, David Wise group uh, in, in various countries. And the, the blue uh, numbers are actual work, actual employment rate. And the orange ones are the excess that, that, that are the potential uh, work rates determined by their health. Uh, so, so if we if we look at women, um, so women between age 60 to 64, the actual the actual employment rate uh, was 22 percent in 2018, and actually 38 percent more could be working if health is the sole explanation. And you can see that uh, our uh, potential uh, is higher <laughs> than many countries in, than, than Sweden, Japan, US. So the excess, the, the wasted, unutilized work, work capacity is uh, among women aged 60 to 65 is more than many other countries. And this is because uh, Chinese women retired too early. But if you look at uh, older group, uh, 65 to 69, many other country OECD countries, they catch up in, in their waste of uh, human resources or workforce um, in, in, in this. Um, so, uh, so, so that's, uh, and then uh, it's interesting if we, if we look at just the 60 to 64 group, uh, there are more um, six, 22 percent men or women are working, but 38 percent is is near doubling the, the waste is near doubling the already used uh, part. So there's a huge human resource that can be used if retirement policy is designed correctly, so so that people have incentives um, to to work. Um, and I believe that's the topic that Jaime is covering in the next presentation. So my time is up. Thank you for listening. That was really interesting. Thank you. So let's move on to um, 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 Professor Hanming Fang of the University of Pennsylvania, um, who's going to talk about uh, delay the pension age or adjust the pension benefit implications for labor supply and individual welfare in China. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me to um, to present in this webinar, and I enjoyed listening to the previous three speakers. Um, and here, thank you also, uh, Yao Hui, for putting together the child's data, which we'll be using here in the paper I will present. Um, and so this is joint to work with um, um, quite a few um, SIPA scholars. Uh, Katia Kindwood is here, Shang Wu was. Um, um, a, a, a student and then a, a research fellow, uh, a postdoc at SIPA, and Yuan Yuan was uh, at uh, a postdoc at SIPA as well. And I uh, was uh, uh, affiliated with SIPA uh, China uh, Population Aging Center um, some years ago as well. So this paper will be focusing on the ideas of, um, um, of pension reform in China. Um, okay, so. Uh, no need to uh, go through much details here. You know, population there is a pop, rapid population aging in China. The old age dependency ratio will be uh, more than doubling uh, in the next thirty years, and uh, and you know, driven by increasing life expectancy as well as uh, rapid declines uh, in uh, total fertility rates. And China's pension system uh, is multi-layered, and uh, uh, there are a lot of uh, issues. Um, and one of which uh, Professor Yao Hui Zhao just uh, highlighted the big differences between rural and urban. Um, that, that's something that we wouldn't uh, touch upon in this paper, um, but I will focus on instead another glaring feature of the Chinese pension system, which is uh, you know, internet, uh, across international comparison, uh, China has a very uh, low uh, pension age, right? So for male, uh, the eligible pension age is 60, and for female, uh, it's either 50 or 55, depending on 
um, whether uh, the, the, the job is blue collar or white collar. And, uh, and most of females uh, pension eligible age is 50. And uh, the, uh, an important, and I think a reform proposal that has been uh, considered uh, sometime uh, in China. I think the discussion started in, uh, in China around 2010, but uh, with the first uh, formal proposal uh, appearing in 2012. Um, but you know, 10 years later, uh, the reform of uh, gradually uh, raising uh, the pension age is still under a discussion. Um, so the proposal was to gradually raise the pension eligible age to age 65 for those who are covered by the basic old age insurance pension scheme. And uh, um, there, you know, um, uh, some of the analysis will shed light on why there is big pushback or, you know, uh, lack of public support uh, for the race of pension eligible age. And our idea here is to get, you know, do some formal analysis of the implications of increasing, increasing pension age on Chinese labor supply and individual welfare. And uh, with the models that we'll calibrate it will also allow us to, to do some counterfactual uh, policy analysis, trying to uh, figure out, for example, whether there are alternative uh, pension reform ideas that can um, you know, put, potentially reduce the budget deficit of the current pension scheme at the same time with you know, uh, not hurting individual welfare uh, as the uh, straight, you know, straight kind of uh, a, um, a postponement of the reti retirement age. Okay. So um, uh, I'm gonna skip this slide. I uh, go directly to what we do in the paper. We develop a life cycle model of labor supply and a consumption for Chinese urban male. We'll uh, not focus on the rural urban uh, divide, uh, focus on urban male instead. Because uh, uh, you know, the, the, uh, as uh, Yao Hui said, uh, the rural um, you know, uh, population, their retirement age is not too much affected by uh, 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 by pension scheme, right? They, the, the, the labor force participation rate uh, is a lot higher in rural, uh, both for a male and a female, okay? And uh, um, so uh, we'll, we'll propose a model of labor supply, uh, a life cycle model, labor supply and consumption. Um, and then we'll use it to quantify the implications of three hypothetical reforms on labor supply, on individual welfare, and on government budget, right? the, the budget of the pension system for the uh, basic old age uh, insurance scheme. Uh, the three reform proposals will consider using, uh, will evaluate using the estimate, uh, calibrated life cycle model is the first one is just increase the pension age from 60 to 65, right? So the current uh, eligible age is 60 for urban male. We, what if we just increase the pension age to 65 uh, without any adjustment on uh, pension benefits after 65 and so on, right? Uh, second uh, it, a proposal is proportionally, uh, will uh, we'll increase the, uh, uh, will proportionally reduce the pension benefits, not changing the pension eligible age though, and to ensure that the pension program's budget impact of the, of the uh, you know, the sec uh, so when we proportionally reduce the pension benefits, without raising the pension eligible age, uh, we'll ensure that uh, um, the adjustment of the pension benefits is such that the pension program's budget is the same as under reform number one, right? So um, in some ways, a, a reform proposal number two will get us at, you know, how much is the implied uh, pension reduction um, uh, uh, under reform, uh, reform proposal number one, okay? Uh, the, 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 the third proposal we'll evaluate is uh, more like a Plato uh, improvement kind of proposal. We'll consider a proposal where we'll simultaneously increase the pension eligible age to 65, but we'll adjust the pension benefits, uh, you know, uh, uh, judiciously uh, to ensure that those both sk both skill types, right? we in the model will have low skill and high skill types. We uh, right, both skill types will attain the same individual welfare. As in the status quo, in the as in the baseline, right, with a with a base uh, retirement age of sixty, right. So, and we will see whether such a uh, reform will potentially help reduce uh, the deficit of the pension system, right. So, the individual welfares are in, uh, are are 
designed to be the same as the baseline, so no one will uh, will object to the reform, right? Uh, but uh, the question is, can it uh, can such a reform proposal potentially help with the budget situation of the of the pension system? And we I already mentioned here we actually uh, do distinguish high skill and low skill workers, and uh, and uh, you know the uh, some of the data will I will show later show that you know high skill low low skill. Uh, exhibit very different uh, patterns in uh, in uh, labor force participation and the consumption over their life cycle. So it's important for us to distinguish this. And they, these uh, two groups of workers have different preferences. Uh, you know, we allow them to have different preferences and we allow them to have different health dynamics and out-of-pocket medical expenditures and they will have different age wage profiles. All of these will be calibrated from, from the data, okay? Uh, so uh, I'm sure I'm going to run out of uh, time. So let me summarize the results beforehand. Relative to the baseline, the status quo of uh, retirement age at 60 at the current pension uh, benefit formula, uh, the reform proposal number one, increasing the pension eligible age, right, uh, to six, from age 60 to 65, or not changing the retirement age, but proportionally lowering the pension benefit to, so that the pension system will have the same a uh, cost, uh, same uh, 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 budget implication. Um, under both of these uh, two uh, reform proposals, they not surprising, not surprisingly, will substantially improve the budget of the pension system. Right after all, you increase the retirement age, making it uh, making uh, the pensioners uh, uh, eligible to receive pension uh, for fewer number of years. Right, so that will improve the budget system, the budget situation of the pension system. And it will slightly increase the overall labor supply, overall labor supply. The big problem is that these two reforms comes at a very big cost. We'll quantify the cost of substantial individual welfare loss for both skill types, right? So, uh, so that's probably one reason why there's so much public uh, uh, opposition against the, the reform of uh, uh, reform proposals to, uh, to raise pension eligible age. Uh, the interestingly, in the reform proposal number three, though, we simultaneously uh, increase the pension eligible age and pension benefits to compensate the individuals to make sure that they are, you know, they are not made worse off, right? Uh, we can actually modestly improve the budget of the pension system. There is such a, a reform uh, 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 that can, can not, you know, can increase the budget situation of the pension system without hurting uh, either groups or individuals. Uh, in terms of the individual welfare. Now, how modest is this? Our reform, uh, uh, you know, we found that we can uh, uh, improve the budget or reduce the budget deficit by about 5.5%. And, uh, and, 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 and uh, there's a slight reduction of the overall, overall labor supply, right? So when we, when, even though the eligible uh, pension age is, is increased in uh, proposal number three, because the individuals are optimizing over their life cycle, they will adjust their life uh, labor supply throughout the life cycle, even though the eligible uh, pension eligible age uh, is increased from 60 to 65. They, they will work more after 60, uh, between 60 to 65, but they will slightly work less uh, early in early years. So, and the overall labor supply may come, um, is uh, reduced slightly. Okay, uh, there are a lot of literature I'm gonna skip uh, for the interest of time. The, just uh, mentioned that in terms of contribution to the existing literature, uh, we contribute to the ongoing policy debate in China about pension reforms. We quantify the implications of the pension eligible age, pension benefits in a single framework. Uh, we uh, uh, one important contribution actually is we provide a, a, a very close approximation of the current pension formula of the you know of the uh, basic old age uh, insurance scheme, and we quantify the heterogeneous effects of, uh, of these different reforms on different uh, 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 workers of different skill types. Okay, uh, very briefly, what are the ingredients of the model? Like I said, it's a life cycle model, uh, aging. We start modeling aging uh, in these uh, urban males from when they were age 45 and uh, 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 solve their problem until they reach a maximum, uh, until they, they reach a maximum, possibly reaching a maximum age of 100. The workers de derive utility from consumption. They incur disutility from working. 
and the disutility from working may depend on their uh, skill type as well as their health status, right? Presumably, uh, un, uh, bad workers with bad health will suffer from a more disutility from working. They do have bequest motives. These are important things for Chinese uh, 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 households. They always want to leave something for their children. And they, in the model, they make binary labor supply decisions, work versus not work. Uh, you know, work means work more than 20 hours a week. Um, um, and, and, but they also make con continuous consumption decisions in each period. There are two skill types, high skill or low skill. High skill in the, in the empirical section will correspond to individuals with a high school graduation, high school degree or more uh, years, uh, years of schooling. And low skill is uh, those with, uh, with uh, less than high school uh, skill. Uh, health uh, status evolves over time. Uh, there are three health stat states, good health or bad health. Uh, in the data, which we'll use you know, uh, is child's data, bad health will be corresponding to individuals who self-reported their health status to be poor. And there's also an observing state of death and mortality. all these transitions uh, between good, bad health as well as into the absorbing state of death will be um, uh, um, uh, will be um, uh, use, uh, estimated using a generalized uh, linear modeling approach. Okay, medical expenditures it follows uh, in the what's in the literature. You know, for individual at uh, at age T uh, with a skill level S, when the health status is HT, HT is either good or bad, all right, or or death actually. Uh, with some probability, uh, probability which we estimate, there is no zero medical expenditure. With complementary probability, there will be some medical expenditure that we estimate in the data, right? We are allowing individuals who will be dying in a given year uh, to have positive medical, medical expenditure because in the data we do, you know, individuals don't do, die in the beginning of the year. Often there will be medical expenditure, uh, you know, uh, in the year when the, one, uh, when the individual dies, okay? And uh, utility function uh, is as this. I, I will just, you know, uh, some uh, see a top Douglas aggregation with a constant relative risk version of, uh, of gamma. And uh, here I would like to highlight this omega HS indicates uh, the disutility from working. Tau is the indicator of whether you work or not. Tau T equal to one means that individual at age T is working and suffers a disutility of, one, uh, uh, of omega HS. S is the skill, H is the health status. And these things again will be estimated, right? We will assume that individuals will always retire at age 75, right? After 75, they are in retirement uh, by default. The question is between you know, age 60 to 75, whether they work or not. They can, under the current retirement age of 60, they can still work after 60, right? But they will no longer be eligible. They will, uh, they, uh, but they will, uh, but if the retirement age is raised to 65, uh, then they will no longer be eligible to receive pension benefits between age 60 and 65, right? Another important thing is when you raise a, a eligible a pension eligible age is about the tax taxation of the income from the work you do between 16 and 65. Under the current system, if you you know after 60, 60 you can still work and your, your, your income received after retirement is not taxed. And if the pension eligible age is raised to 65, and then you, know, you will be taxed between 60 uh, for the income you received between 60 and 65, okay? Uh, bequest motive uh, follows Denardi et al., French, Jones et al. paper. Uh, and uh, and this, you know, the, uh, the, the individuals are making decisions about how much to consume and save and how much to work. Uh, with this bequest uh, motivation in mind. Uh, there's budget constraints and, uh, and I'm gonna, uh, here basically we model the uh, individual's uh, um, uh, pension wealth, um, pension wealth actually, sorry. Um, uh, pension wealth is, so this is individuals, uh, uh, the evolution of individuals uh, uh, wealth uh, following the, you know, uh, you have the initial wealth, the, uh, the income, medical expenditure, some government transfers, and the consumption uh, you, uh, uh, you consume in age T, okay? Labor income uh, is estimated separately for workers of different skill types and different health status, okay? Okay, uh, pensionable income is, uh, you know, is pretty complicated in China. It depends on 
the individual's wage history before retirement and the local average wage of all workers in a given year, the ratio between these two in, uh, during all these working years and the individual's year of retirement. So it's too pretty complicated in particular, if you want to really uh, model the pension, pension income process very accurately, you have to you know, actually measure the local average wage, take the complete history of the individual's uh, uh, wages uh, in, the, in his working years and so on. We provide a pretty good approximation of the statutory pension benefits using a linear function of the average wage over individual's career uh, and the number of years individual has worked, okay? So this may be useful for other researchers who are thinking about modeling Chinese uh, pension, uh, pension system. Um, let me skip this. Uh, we solve the you know, model uh, using dynamic programming and then uh, try to calibrate the, mo uh, the model parameters by matching some important moments uh, in the data. Okay, the data we use is Charles as well as uh, uh, CLHLS, Chinese Longitudinal Health, uh, Healthy Longevity, uh, Longevity Survey, okay? Uh, some status facts are uh, distinguished by the skill type. You see that skilled workers, workers of high skills work, uh, has higher labor force participation rate when they are younger, but they actually uh, uh, have lower work, uh, labor force participation rate when they get older, okay? And uh, same thing, you know, high skilled workers uh, consume, uh, average consumption is higher than low skilled workers throughout their life cycle. And, uh, uh, and uh, you know, they are also high skilled workers are healthier than low skilled workers throughout their life cycle. Okay. And I'm going to, uh, we, we, we do calibrate the parameters. I'm going to skip these parameters uh, uh, and values for the interest of time. I, only thing I will highlight is, for example, the disutility of work for workers in good health and bad health, uh, you know, do, uh, do show some uh, reasonable patterns. Uh, this utility work is lower for good individuals in, in good health than in poor health, okay, for both uh, uh, skill types. Okay, model fits pretty good. Let me uh, use the remaining uh, a minute and a half uh, to talk about policy experiments. Uh, the first reform uh, proposal just raised the pension age from 60 to 65. And then second reform is keep the pension age at 60, but reduce the annual pension benefit by a proportionality factor Row two, which we actually calibrate uh, to ensure that the impact of reform two on the budget of the pension program's budget is, uh, is the same as reform number one, okay? Reform number three, simultaneously raise the pension age to 65 and increase the pension benefits proportionally by skill type, right? So, so that individuals of both skill type is equally well off under this reform proposal than in the, uh, than, uh, in the status quo. And uh, uh, let me uh, show this one. Um, in terms, we basically have uh, the, uh, evaluated the effects of reform on labor supply and on benefits uh, on the pension uh, bu uh, 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 budget. Uh, you see that under reform proposal number one, the labor force participation rate between for age 60 to 65, 64 will increase, right? For both skill types, okay? Um, uh, but, and it will also increase uh, the uh, average retirement age and average working years for high skill types and, uh, and, and uh, for low skill types, uh, not much effect, okay? And under reform proposal number two, labor force passing rate will also increase uh, at, uh, 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 even though the retirement age is six, remain at 60 under reform two, uh, the, the, the labor force participation rate will increase uh, uh, for, those, uh, for the ages between 16 and 64 because individuals are solving a life cycle model, okay? And the reform number three, um, you know, the, 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 the retirement age is increased, but uh, the pension benefits reduce, uh, uh, reduce quite a lot, actually. Um, sorry, uh, sorry, the retirement age is increased the pension, be pension benefits actually have to be increased quite a lot in order to make them uh, 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 indifferent, okay? The overall labor supply is lower uh, in, in reform number three. Uh, in terms of budget, this is the key number. Uh, baseline, the budget system faces a deficit of about $112,000 uh, per worker. Uh, reform number one and number two, both will reduce the deficit a lot, right? More than. 85% uh, reduction in the per person deficit, 
Now, reform number three, remember every, everybody is equally bad, uh, uh, well, well off under reform number three, as in the baseline, but the, best, uh, the deficit is reduced by about 6,000 6, 6, yuan IMB per worker, well, accounts for about 5.5%, okay? What about the welfare? So this reform number two, one and two, they reduce the budget deficit of the pension system a lot, but the, the, it comes at a cost of huge welfare loss for the workers. We calculated that in order to count uh, uh, the reform number one, for example, will, uh, 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 the high skilled workers will, will need a, about 114% increase in their initial wealth to make them, to compensate them, compensate them for the welfare loss coming from just raising the eligible age from 60 to 65. Reform number two, uh, similarly, right? So there's a huge, uh, even higher welfare loss uh, than uh, reform number one. Um, uh, uh, let me just summarize. Uh, uh, this is uh, uh, what I just mentioned, reform number three, right? In order to make individuals equally uh, well off as in the baseline, uh, if you raise the pension age from 60 to 65, the low skilled workers, right? Need to be, um, uh, uh, their pension benefits in the retirement, uh, uh, at the retirement, right? After 65, need, need to be raised by about 20% than the current level. For the high skilled workers, they need to be raised by about 26% uh, to be uh, uh, to ensure that they will not object to the uh, to the to the uh, increase of pension age. The overall pension system, though, can still uh, 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 the the fiscal situation can still in, uh, improve by about 5.5 percentage points. So I will conclude here since I'm already running out of time. Um, uh, we develop a heterogeneous aging life cycle model to evaluate the implications of three pension reforms uh, to, uh, uh, to the basic older age insurance scheme in China on individual labor supply, individual welfare uh, for Chinese urban males aged 45 and older. Um, our preferred pension reform uh, critically depends on policymakers objective. If the objective is to increase labor supply and improve the social sustainability of the system, Reducing pension benefits is the best. The second reform is the best, okay? But if the goal is to improve the budget of the pension uh, program while ensure that both skill types are not made worse off, then a combined reform that simultaneously increases the pension eligible age and proportionally raise the pension benefits may be an option to pursue. It can, you know, at least uh, 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 gather the necessary uh, public, public support to move forward. Uh, with a uh, with a reform that can you know uh, uh, slightly improve uh, the uh, fiscal condition of the system, I stop here. Thank you very much, and thank you everyone. There are a lot of people stayed on the line. Um, in fact, um, we haven't had a lot of people leave. So thank you very much. Um, thank you for all the presenters. Um, thank you for CPAR to help organize. Thank you in particular for IPRA, whose whose webinar this is. For people who haven't joined IPRA. Um, please go to the upper website and join um, and keep an eye out for the next set of events. And again, thank you very much and um, goodbye everyone.